Gospel of John. We're continuing on. It's telling the story of Jesus. And we come to two miracles in today's story. They're both healing miracles. And so I want, we're going we're gonna to explore, we're going to unpack um, what I'm going to call a, a, a theology of healing. I want to talk about healing. Healing is one of those things that the enemy has um, created confusion, um, division in the church, bad theology about uh, God and healing and me and faith and our part and disease and sickness and all of that. Um, and so we want to take time to, to try and understand biblically about that and, and all that that means. Uh, I'll tell you right now, we're going to end our service by having a, a time of prayer for, for healing. So if you're sitting here with anything, um, I, I'll just kind of let the cat out of the bag. We, we believe that God still heals. We believe he's not done. I'm going to try to prove to you from Scripture why that is and that he wants us to participate with him in that. We're going to go there. Um, our, we need healing. Our world needs healing. Um, our communities need healing. Our families need healing. We live in a broken world. 70% of, of Americans uh, are on some form of prescription medication. I read that this week. 70% of Americans. 50% are on two or more. Our bodies are, are broken and getting, uh, uh, getting worse, wasting away sickness, disease, ailments, infirmities. They, they plague us. And um, it's a reminder to us of that this is not our home, that this can't be all there is, that this can't be as, as good as it gets, that there is something else, there is a future place for us. Um, I mean, just 24 hours ago, we were in here, and we had a funeral for, for our beloved Kathy Fitzgerald, one of, one of ours here at Next and her family, and so moving the way that... Um, she loved Jesus, loved his word, and had an impact on so many people, but su suddenly gone. And it leaves you with questions as to why and how, how, does, how does God work when it comes to sickness and healing and disease? And why is it sometimes yes and why is it sometimes no? And so we're going to look at all of that today. And I'll just tell you, my prayer is that your faith would be stoked, that, that your faith would be challenged and encouraged and would go up a step when it comes to what God says in his word about knocking on the door of heaven and continuing to ask and not be discouraged and not to give up. So um, that's where we're at today. Two healing miracles. They're, they're only in the Gospel of John. You're not going to find these stories in any of the other Gospels. Not Matthew, not Mark, not Luke. They're just here in John. And so the first one, uh, we're starting in chapter 4, verse 43. It involves a little boy. And so, um, it's man, it's always... I want you to use your holy imagination to put yourself in this story, right? It's always hard when you see little ones suffer. And so that's what we see here today. So I want you to, to use your imagination, put yourself in the story. Some of you don't, like, I don't have to use imagination. I walk this road, and you know it's a horrible road to walk. Verse 43 is where we pick up. It says, after two days, he being Jesus, left there for Galilee, we'll, we'll We'll put the map up in a second. Again, I want you to get the context of everything that's going on here. Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. All right? Prophets, no honor in his hometown. And that's, that's kind of just the way it is. Maybe you've even experienced that in your life. You grew up in a town and uh, you were maybe, um, well, you were a little, little Johnny, a little Joey. And then you go away to college and you, you mature a little bit and you get your, a job, something like that. And then you move back home. But you're always kind of be known as like little Joe. I I know you. You're, you used to throw snowballs at our cat, right? And like and so and so you kind of have that kind of re reputation. And so I wonder, Jesus, right? Obviously, not that he would do wrong, but it's like it's kind of hard sell when you come back to your hometown, and they know you. You're we know you. You're marrying Joseph's. Kid. What do you mean you're God? You're marrying Joseph's kid. We know you, right? And so this is what Jesus is saying. It's a hard thing to come back to your hometown. But when they entered Galilee, that's the region, the Galileans welcomed him. Why? Because they had seen everything he did in Jerusalem during the festival, for they also had gone to the festival, right? So uh, I'll talk about that in a second. Let's just kind of refresh ourselves where we're at here, if you can put that map up. Jesus was down in Jerusalem at the festival. Remember, he was there for Passover, he, uh, what, what they remembered that Jesus did, and they were there as they saw Jesus come into Jerusalem, and they turned church into a flea market. Remember, we talked about that about a month ago. 
And Jesus flipped over the tables and shooed out the animals and got rid of the money changers because they made God's house something that it shouldn't be. And so then he says, hey, let's go back up to, to the north region. And he goes right through Samaria, which is a big no-no to the Jews. He was supposed to go over to Jordan River, up, and then back over. But Jesus is like, I don't care about racial things and cultural things. I love all people. The good news is for all people. And so he goes through Samaria. And now he's coming up into Galilee. I don't know if you can see it there in red. It's Cana. That's where he's going to end up. And this story takes place in Cana. That should sound a little bit familiar. Remember what happened in Cana? His first what? His first miracle happened in Cana, right? Turned the water and the wine at the wedding. And um, I want you to look at the very top of the Sea of Galilee there. If you can see that, there's a little town there called Capernaum, the village of Capernaum. And the village of Capernaum was about 25 miles from Capernaum to Cana. And that's important to know because the guy in the story is going to come from Capernaum to Cana, we'll see, pleading for his little boy's life. And so um, it says this, verse 46, he went again to Cana of Galilee, so Jesus is going back there, where he turned the water into wine, and there was a certain royal official whose son was ill at Capernaum. And when this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea into Galilee, he went to him, he travels to Cana, and pleaded with him to come down and heal his son since he was about to die. So this guy, the reason it says come down is Cana was elevated 600 feet above sea level. Uh, Capernaum was at sea level. So this guy leaves his town and goes 25 miles uphill to Cana to go to see Jesus. Why? Because his son is about to die. It says that he was a royal official. Um, the word there in, in the Greek language, it, it, it has the idea of royalty. He was probably a part of Herod's palace in some way, whether it was family or distant family or the position that he held. He was a man of means. He had power. He had authority. He had position. He had wealth. And he was not used to being in this position where he had no control over what was happening to his little boy. Perhaps you've been there. And as parents, right, when you see your little one suffer, you, you, you kind of you say things like, God, just give me the pain. Just, I'll take it. Give me their, their thing. Like there's anything that you would do to kind of see your little one be healed. And nothing he would do and nothing he did. And he probably tried everything in the area. He had money and position and power. And there was no doctor. There was no human means in which his boy would get better. And he's about to lose his son. And so he decides, what's it going to hurt? And so he, he, he takes, it's about a day's journey. That's what they would walk back then. They'd walk about 20, 25 miles. That was a, considered a day's journey. So he leaves Capernaum and he walks 20, 25 miles uphill to Capernaum to find Jesus. And he finds Jesus and he just wants Jesus to heal his son. And Jesus says something that's kind of odd as a response. It doesn't seem very Jesus-like. In verse 48, he goes and says, Jesus told him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Which feels like a rebuke. Like here comes this guy, this desperate dad, coming and going to plead with Jesus to come heal his son. And Jesus is rebuking him. But I want you to pay attention to the language. And this is why, one of the reasons why I love the CSB translation. We made that move a year ago, switched to the CSB. It's such a faithful translation to the original language, but it puts it in such like readability of, of, of kind of our current language today. Um, he says, unless you people, if you have your Bible in front of you, you don't have the CSB. It might just say, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. But the you in the original Greek is plural. And so the CSB adds people in there to give the context that Jesus is not rebuking this guy. He's talking to the people. Unless you people. He's talking to the people that they were there and they kind of, you kind of get the idea, they wanted to see the next show. Like what, was, what neat thing was Jesus going to do next? 
Right? Jesus kind of had in his mind he was coming to town and he wasn't going to be welcomed because the prophet isn't welcome in his hometown. But they kind of did welcome him. But they welcomed him because they saw the show he put on in Jerusalem when he's flipping over tables. And so that, that guy's coming back and they knew about the miracle of turning water into wine. And like, we're a big fan of that show. And so what's he going to do next? And so when Jesus says, man, you, it, it's almost as if he's saying, you're just here for the show, for the signs and the wonders, you people, not you father, desperate father, but Jesus is not like some sideshow. And he's not some carny or traveling kind of freak show. Jesus is the son of God who is there to save the world from their sins. And so he wants to make sure they're not getting sidetracked by the sideshow, but they're not missing the main attraction. God is in their presence. And so he, he kind of rebukes them a little bit. And Jesus, uh, this father would not be deterred. Sir, the official said to him, come down before my boy dies. Now, can you hear the desperation in his voice? Please, sir, please come before my boy dies. It's probably, probably the first time in this guy's life he's had to beg for something, right? A, a man of position, a man of power, a man of wealth, now begging for his boy's life. And then Jesus says this, go, Jesus told them, your son will live. And the man believed what Jesus said to him and departed. Now, <laughs> I don't know about you, I've asked you to put yourself in the story. I put myself in the story this week and I'm there. If I walk 25 miles uphill to this town and I get to Jesus and he hears me and I say, please, please, please come, my boy, please come and heal. And Jesus gives me this line, go. He's going to be okay. I want just a little bit more. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I, want, a, I want a little bit more than that. Then go, he's going to be well. Um, can, you, can, you, can you write it down? Can you give me your phone number so when I leave we can get like, like I want something else. But look what, look what it says. It says the man believed what Jesus said. And we're going to see it time and time and time again as we go through John's gospel that John is all about getting you to believe, believe, believe who Jesus is. This is what he wants to stress. You've got to believe that Jesus is the son of God. And so it says while he was still going down. So now at least he's traveling 25 miles downhill going back home. So while he's going down, his servants met him saying his boy was alive. And he asked them at what time he got better. Yesterday, one in the afternoon, the fever left him, they answered. And the father realized that this was the very hour at which Jesus had told him, your son will live. And so he himself believed and along with his whole household. And so, again, you see belief stressed. And now, kind of like last week we saw with the Samaritan woman at the well, she came to believe in Jesus, and what did she do? She went into town, and she told everybody. And what's this guy do? He comes to believe in Jesus, and now his household follows along. Which, just as a quick side note, let me talk to you, you fathers out there. Let me talk to you men out there. But there is something about when men set the spiritual pace in their, with their families and in their household. And so, men, I want to lovingly challenge you, encourage you, to not, it's so easy for us to be spiritually lazy. That is the sin of our father, Adam, to have spiritual laziness. And so I encourage you to, to step into that spiritual um, leading, that spiritual guiding, that you would be the one in your house that is, 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 is setting the spiritual temperature. You're dialing up the spiritual temperature of your family. That's what this guy did. He came back and his whole family came along. And so it's kind of like as, as the, 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 the man goes, dads, be the one to set the, ta the, the, the pace in your family. And so John says, verse 54, now this was also the second sign Jesus performed after he came from Judea to Galilee. Again, John doesn't use the word miracle. He uses the word signs. It's the idea that he's, his signs are pointing towards a direction. And so the whole thing, again, J John is wanting his audience to see is who Jesus is. 
This is the second sign that summarizes it. There's only going to be seven. As you read through John, John highlights seven signs, seven miracles. And so this is the second one he's saying. And now we're going to turn the page to chapter 5, and we're going to go right into the next, the third sign. And it's going to be another healing. And I, I want you to, I think John on purpose puts these healings back to back. I don't think they, I think there was things that happened in between, but in John's telling the story of Jesus, he puts them back to back. So turn the page, chapter 5, verse 1, says, After this, a Jewish festival took place, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. So now he's coming back down. He's coming back down to Jerusalem. Um, on the map, it's down, but elevation-wise, Jerusalem is even higher, so that's why it always says up. And it says, By the Sheep Gate in Jerusalem... There is a pool called Bethesda in Aramaic, which has five colonnades. And within these lay a large number of the disabled, blind, lame, and paralyzed. And so John doesn't tell us what feast it was, which one of the Jewish feasts it was, but Jesus is now back down to Jerusalem. And um, I would say if, if when we go, I'd say when we go to Israel, when we take our next community church class trip to Israel, which we're going to be saving up for it, okay? Be putting your quarters in your jars. You're going to be saving up. Yeah. <laughs> All right, sweet. Some, one of you, we'll go. We'll have a good time together. <laughs> Except you got to start putting more than quarters in because I just checked the pricing. It's, it's like everything else in the world's gone up. So you better start putting 20s in your jar instead of quarters or else we ain't going to get there. But when you go, we'll go visit this pool. They've excavated this pool. Archaeologists have discovered this pool. They've excavated it. It's actually two pools side by side. It's about the size of a football field. So when you think a pool, I mean, just imagine a pool being the size of this room right, and then at least like double it to like almost triple it. This is a massive pool, 20 feet deep. And, and so um, you can go, you can visit this pool. And what, what was believed to have happened, if you, again, if you have your Bible in front, or if you notice we're at verse 3, we're about to put up verse 5. There is no verse 4. You have a little footnote in your Bibles, and what it's going to say is the best manuscripts, the earliest manuscripts, which are usually the best manuscripts, don't have verse 4. It's believed that 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 was added in later by an editor. This shouldn't throw off your trust in the inspiration or the preservation of God's Word that was trying to help give some context to what's going on here. And what verse 4 would say is that there was an angel of the Lord that would come down and stir up the waters of the pool, and whoever was the first one that's laying around the pool to get in, that one got healed. And so um, it's believed that that was added in to kind of help give context to the story. And so the best manuscripts don't have that. They leave it out. And so verse 5 says, One man was there who had been disabled for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and realized he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to get well? Which is a very interesting interaction that happens here because it's one of the only times where Jesus approaches a person and asks about them getting well, it's almost every other time the person approaching Jesus and asking for healing or asking to get well. And so this interaction, you're going to see, is very different than the story that we just read. And this is why I think John is putting them together to kind of help us develop our theology of healing, that just when you think you've got it figured out, He's like, no, this one's going to be totally different. Story one, desperate father coming long ways, pleading on behalf of his son, having faith, believing that Jesus could do this. Jesus just says the words. He's like, that's good enough for me. Turns and starts walking back home. Here you have this guy. Jesus approaches this guy. He doesn't ask Jesus. Jesus asked him. And it seems like this guy has no faith because look at his response. Verse 7, Sir, the disabled man answered, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water stirred up. But while I'm coming, someone goes down ahead of me. So listen. I mean, if I was Jesus, and I come up and I say, do you want to get well? And this is the response. My, My response would be, 
Cool story, bro. Not the question I asked you, right? Do you want to get well? And what's this guy's response? Think about it. If you were there 38 years, some of you aren't even close to 38 years old. If you were laying there 38 years and the healer in the town comes to you and says, do you want to get well? What's your first response? Yes, yes, I do. I've been, yes, I've been wanting and waiting and waiting. And, and so this guy doesn't say yes. What's he give? <coughs> He's got an excuse. He's got a story. And again, not the main point of this story, but I think it's a side note, and I want to just lovingly throw it out there and invite you to maybe wrestle through this a little bit because we see this from time to time in our Monday Night Renew ministry, helping people heal from their brokenness and bad patterns and habits and changing, is sometimes we don't want to change. Sometimes we've gotten so used to living life with a limp, and we've figured out how to make life work this way, it's kind of like, mm, I'll dance with the devil I know. I know how to make life work this way. Because you know what? Change is hard work. Growth is hard work. Kind of looking in the mirror at why I'm this way and how I got to be this way. You know what? I don't want to go through the hardship of really changing my thinking or my believing or my acting I'll just stay. I think, and you'll see as we go on in the story, and we're going to pick it up even more next week, I think there's some of that going on with this guy. That This guy, I think, to be honest with you, I think he had no faith. And I don't even think he wanted to change. I mean, 38 years? 38 years you're laying by this pool? You can't convince one buddy to be there with you? So that when the water does stir, it can kick you in and get you in. What, like, and so it's almost like this guy, and you'll see if you don't agree with me, you'll maybe see next week as we go through. You're like, man, you're being hard on this, this paralyzed guy. I, I, I don't think that he really wanted to believe in Jesus and change. So Jesus says, you want to get better? I got no one to help me. And look, look at Jesus' response. Get up, Jesus told them. Pick up your mat and walk. And instantly the man got well, picked up his mat, started to walk. And then John says, now that day was the Sabbath. As if to leave us with a cliffhanger, that's where we're going to stop. It sets up <laughs> the conflict that's now going to come where we'll pick up next week. Up to this point in John's gospel, Jesus has moved about and had relatively zero conflict. It's all been good. I mean, it's all been roses, good stuff happening. And now, John's gospel is about to pivot. We're going to see from chapters 5 through chapters 12 is conflict. And the religious people are going to get really mad at Jesus because he did work on the Sabbath. And we're going to see how religion and relationship with God comes into collision with one another over the next six chapters, seven chapters. And so... But here's the story. Jesus heals us. Jesus approaches this guy. The guy doesn't ask. Jesus says, do you want to get better? The guy doesn't say yes, and Jesus heals him. Compared to the first story, where the guy walks 25 miles, begs for his son's life, Jesus says yes. It's like, it's like two completely different stories. And I don't know about you, it raises a lot of questions to me about how God works and why God works. And what about healing? I mean, don't raise your hand, but how many of you have prayed for something, even specifically in regards to healing, and it didn't happen? And it felt like your prayers just bounced off the floor of heaven. And, and how many of you, if you'll be honest, don't raise your hand again, you'd say, that, 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 that did damage to me in my relationship with God. That, that one got me. And so how does this healing thing work? And does God still heal? Is that just something that he did? And so here's what I want to do. I want to spend the rest of our time talking about, I'm, I'm calling it an intro to a theology of healing, that, that we would go to the scriptures and that you would develop, because listen, I think this is really important. I already kind of told you where we're going, so I already kind of tipped my hand as to what I believe the scriptures say, and I think what most of you believe. But if you're here and you're skeptical or you've got doubts or you've got kind of like, wounds that you feel like are wounds from God, from unanswered prayers, 
I want, I want to go with me on this journey here a little bit, okay, as we develop this. And so I want to, I want to try and, and, and flesh this out a little bit. And for, to do that, I'm going to go way back to the beginning, okay? We're going to go back to the beginning when God made everything. And when God made everything, he made everything in six days. And when he got done, he pronounced it what? Pronounced it good. It was good. Every day, as a matter of fact, when he got done, he pronounced it good. And on the sixth day, he got done. So creation was good. As a matter of fact, it was perfect. No suffering, no pain, no sickness, no evil, no sin, no fights, no None of that. It was good, right? And so let's, let's kind of represent it like this. You can kind of laugh at my, um, that's the United States. <laughs> and I can't remember which way South America goes. Is it this way? And Africa goes this way. Okay, so you get the idea that God made the world and pronounced it good. And then God is sovereign over all of it, right? And, and what ended up happening with mankind is they had to be in relationship with God, and God wanted it to be a choice. And so that's what real love is. Real love is a choice. If you have to love somebody, that's not love. Love is not forced. Love is not demanded. And God didn't program us that way. And so to, to give us a choice, he put in the garden a tree. And it was called the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And so the idea was is that mankind was supposed to be in such relationship with God that he was their source of life. He was their source of how to live of, of what was good and what was right. He was the truth that was to be the guiding force of them. But because love is a choice, if, if they only had God, then that's not really love. So God put another source of life there, and the enemy came along and tempted our parents to go to a different source on how to live life, that you yourself can have your eyes opened and know good and evil yourself. You don't have to go to the source. You yourself can be your own source of understanding good and evil. And our parents gave in to that temptation and thus brought sin into the world. And that sin came from the tempter, Satan, who God has allowed into this world and has given him a, a temporary time to kind of do what he does. And he has power in this world. He has all that has, is broken and wrong and, and, and then brought pain and suffering and sickness and disease is a result of two things, the enemy doing what he does and us giving in to that temptation. And together, that snowball of brokenness has been spinning for thousands of years. And, and what ends up happening is you and I live in a broken world. We actually live in a world that is in conflict. And we don't think about it a lot, but the Bible talks about it, that there is a spiritual war raging all around us, that you and I live amidst. We're in a war. We're living in the middle of a war, and we don't, but we also live in the most prosperous and comfortable nation in the world. And so, to be honest with you, we don't like to think about the war. We actually don't like to engage in the war. What I want, and what probably most of you want, is I just want to be comfortable. I just want it to be okay, everything to be nice, and I want to take a nice vacation this summer, and I want my kids to all be okay. And, and, and so we live as if there's not a war going on. But make no mistake about it, there is a cosmic spiritual war that is happening in the heavenly places. And so the enemy is coming, and what the enemy wants to do is destroy the works of God. So he made, God made everything good, and it says this about Satan. Jesus said this, we'll get to it in John. Jesus said he's a thief, he's a liar, he has come to steal, kill, and what? Destroy. 
destroy. And so all the enemy is trying to do is destroy the goodness of God. God made everything good. The enemy comes and goes, I'll destroy all that. I'll mess. And he wants to do that in your life and in your family's life. And he's got lots of tools available to destroy your life, the works of God. And then God goes, "Uh -uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. I'm going to send a savior into the world that's going to actually come and destroy the works of Satan who's trying to destroy the works of God. This is what it says in 1 John chapter 3. In 1 John chapter 3, it says this, Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. That's what he does. And then it says this, The reason the Son of God appeared was to what? Was to destroy the works of the devil. So you see how this works? God, everything good, is peaceful in the garden for three chapters. We get to chapter three, enemy shows up. Sin enters the world, and the enemy starts spiritual conflict, and his whole goal, let me destroy everything that God made good, I'm gonna destroy it. God goes, "Uh uh-uh, sends his son into the world, and the son came into the world to destroy the works of the devil who's trying to destroy the good works of his father. And so we're living in the midst of the spiritual conflict. And God's like, listen, one day, this is all going to come to an end. Because one day, what's going to happen? The last book of the Bible says he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth where God's going to push the do-over button again. And every time you see a rainbow, it's a promise that God said, I will not destroy and push the do-over button again by floods. And instead, what's going to happen is he's going to somehow send some kind of fireball that's going to destroy by fire, and God's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. And in Revelation chapter 21, it describes what it's going to be like. It was originally like it was in the garden. It says this. Can you throw up Revelation 21 for me? He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief, crying, pain, no more, because the previous things have passed away. And so God is going to heal the world and make everything new. And for those that have Jesus, that is going to be your promise of what he's going to do. But in the meantime, we live in the midst of a broken world. And what happens is, and this is where you've got to have this theology in your head, a a, a deist A deist believes, deism basically is the belief that God created everything, spun the world into existence, and then walked away from it. That the supernatural is not involved in the natural. That's deism. Some of us live like practical deists. Is that we believe in God, and we believe, you you might even believe everything I'm saying now, and then you live every day of your life like as if he's not there, as if it's all up to you. And, and, And so what you've got to understand is that God... I probably, this is the cool thing about this. God is actually sovereign over all of this, right? God is sovereign over all of this and in control over all of it. And he is actively involved in his world. And he breaks through from time to time. He breaks through and stops the work of Satan that he's doing in this broken world. And we see flashes. We see moments of heaven here on earth. This is what it's going to be like forever. And from time to time, God breaks in here and gives us a glimpse. Does a, does a, we call those things miracles. And so let me share with you why that happens. Why, I want to ask you three questions real quick. Three questions. Um, I might not get to the third one. That's okay. Here's question number one. Why does God heal? Why does he do this? Okay. Answer number one is this to demonstrate that he is the Messiah, that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, that he was the promised son of God, right? This is one of the main reasons why God does miracles is to show everybody he's God. Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew says this in chapter 8. It says, when evening came, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed. He drove out the spirits with a word, and healed all who were sick. So that what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah 
might be fulfilled. That's important. Matthew, under the divine guidance of the Holy Spirit, is attaching what Jesus is doing to a prophecy 800 years ago that Isaiah wrote about what the Messiah would do. And so Matthew is linking them, saying Jesus is the Messiah. What would the Messiah do? Let's go look at Isaiah chapter 53. Here's what the Messiah would do. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of suffering who knew what sickness was. He was like someone people turned away from. He was despised. We didn't value him. Yet he himself bore our sicknesses, and he carried our pains. So when Jesus died on the cross, he not only paid for the sins of the entire world, but when he did that, he provided for God breaking through and providing healing available to undo the work of Satan trying to undo the work of God. He carried our pains, but we in turn regarded him stricken, struck down by God, afflicted. All right? Reason number one, healing happened. He wanted to show he's the Messiah. Reason number two, it wanted to happen, to demonstrate his kingdom. To demonstrate the kingdom of God breaking through on earth to show that there's a better king and a better kingdom. Now, we don't think kingdom. I've told you this before. We don't live in America. We don't think kingdom unless you're one of those ones that's infatuated with what's going on across the pond with royalty and the royal family and all that stuff, like, right? You don't think kingdom. You don't think royalty. But that's the language of the Bible. That was the culture back then. And so when Jesus showed up, he was the king. And so what Jesus is doing is showing how he's bringing the kingdom to earth. He's bringing that here. And what's it going to be like when the king is reigning? There's going to be healing. There's going to be peace. There's going to be no wickedness. There's going to be no evil, right? Because the king will be on his throne. And what the book of Revelation talks about is that during this time, God forever deals with Satan and throws him forever in the lake of fire. So there is no more tempter. There is no one trying to destroy the works of God. He wants to show you his kingdom. Number three, why does God heal? To demonstrate his power. When you feel powerless, there's one who's more powerful. When you feel at the end of your rope, there's one who is sovereign over all of this. His power dwarfs our pain and our suffering. And so why does God heal? To show you who's really in control. And the fourth reason why God heals is to simply just demonstrate his love and compassion. He cares. He loves you. Very simply, why does God step in? Because he loves you. And he cares. It says in Matthew chapter 14, when he went ashore, he saw a large crowd. He had compassion on them. And so what did he do? He healed their sick. There's lots more reasons why God heals. I think the norm in Scripture is that God heals. And then you turn the pages to the book of Acts, and guess what? It continues. And then you come to our experience today, and you're like, yeah, but what about, what about my loved one? What about my family member? What about why does God... Why is he still not doing that today? Why is there unanswered prayers? And, and here, here is the, the honest truth answer that I think anybody would have to come to, but I want to give you permission to say this. And here's, here's my deep theological answer. Why? I don't know. I don't know why God answers some prayers and why he doesn't answer other prayers. I know there's a whole book in the Bible on that, where terrible things happen to an innocent person. And his friends get together and give him all kinds of advice on why he should run away from God and curse God and die. And, and so he starts getting into debates with God. And God says, brace yourself like a man. I will question you. Who is it that darkens the hallways of my counsel? Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? The book is Job, and by the time God is getting done questioning Job about his ways being above Job's ways and 
us not being able to comprehend what God is doing, it's almost like you can't handle the truth. You, you will never know why. And so, and there's all these verses that you've got to wrestle with, and this is why this is an intro to a theology of healing, because there's no way we're going to get to all of this, because there's definitely times where um, we're called to have faith, and we're told to knock, and we've seen healings. We've seen, even last night, we, we believe that we've seen something happen through, through the time here that we're going to have in just a minute. But then there's times where it doesn't happen. It's like, God, why sometimes yes and sometimes no? I, I don't know. But what I can tell you is that the, the, what the enemy would want you to do is to be angry and get discouraged and to shake your fist at heaven and say, God, you're not good. You're not powerful. And you, you can't allow your feelings in that moment to portray or um, go against what God's word says. And so, and then there's other times where we, we develop our own really bad theologies, right? Um, where we say, we say really, just frankly, dumb things to people. Where we say, well, you don't have enough faith. You must have not had enough faith. Which is, which is just a horrible thing to put on somebody who is already suffering in the midst of whatever it is that they're going through in life, and then they're praying and pleading with God, and for whatever reason, he says no, and then you put on top of them while they're already down, well, you just don't have enough faith. As if God moving depends on you or me. That's really bad theology, to think that God is waiting around to do what he's going to do. Let me see how Joe behaves today. Let me see. As if I control God. You see how we can get off that way? Or then we also do things like when we pray, we think we've got to say magic prayer words. And we put this pressure on ourselves, like we're going to get God's attention or impress God if we sound spiritual, we pray the right words, or we pray loud enough, or we pray, pray long enough, or we, like, and, in, and I think God's just like, no. And then you have other verses where you just have to say, all right, it, it, the promise in Scripture is somehow God's going to work all things together for good for those who love him. I don't know how that's going to work. I don't know, but it's a promise from God. And so that's where my faith comes in. I'm going to believe that God's going to do that. But I don't know why, but I know I'm not giving up and I'm not going to stop asking because I, I believe we're told, Jesus told the parable about that, to come knock at the door and you keep knocking. And Why? I think there's a mystery in that. I like what, what Tim Hawkins, um, he's the Christian comedian. I just heard him say this this past week, and I so agree with it. He said, um, the number one word in heaven is going to be, oh. <laughs> and I resonate with that. I think that's what, I think we're going to get up there, and God's going to pop the DVD in, and it's just going to be like, and you're going to be like, Oh, I, that's what, oh, I, and, 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 and it's just going to be eternity of seeing everything that God has done and his complete sovereignty and grandeur that our minds right now just can't even begin to comprehend as we're living in the middle of war and God has provided ultimate healing and sometimes God breaks in and why now and why not now? I don't know, but I know he calls us to ask. And not only that, but he, this is going to really blow some of your minds. Not only does he call us to ask, but he says, hey, I want you to do it too. I'm like, what do you mean? Let me say this, and this is what we're going to end. I know we're a little late. Stay with me. Jesus has commissioned you and I to do the same works that he did when he was physically here on earth. Now let me really push your faith to say he's called you to do it too. You're like, I can't do that. You're exactly right. You can't. But he can in you. The, the God who lives in you has raised the dead power, lives in you. And so this is not me like rah-rah trying to pep you up, church, to kind of like, this is me telling you what Jesus said. Let me read it to you. John 14. We'll get to it in about six months again, just to remind you when we get there in six months, because our faith wavers. Believe me, Jesus said, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Otherwise, he says, believe because of the works themselves. And then he drops this. He says, truly I tell you, the one who believes in me 
will also do the works that I do. He will do even greater works than these because I'm going to the Father. So I'm going to go to the Father. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit who's going to live in you. And is that just, just one of me traveling around from Galilee down to Jerusalem? There's only one of me. There's going to be millions of you all around the earth with God in you. You're going to do greater. Okay. I'm in. I believe Jesus. And so I was wrestling with this message this week. Sometimes the messages really come together quickly and I can get out and play golf on Friday. <laughs> and other times, it's a labor of love, and it's just not coming together. And this week, was just, this was one of them. It was a labor of love. And I didn't know what to do with this, and I was praying about it, and I felt like on Wednesday afternoon, God said, there is no way you can stand up there and talk about how the Bible says I still heal, and then not try it right then and there, and not practice it. Put your money where your mouth is, church, next. So that's how we're gonna end. We got some prayer team people. I asked some elders and some others on the prayer team to come up. And I know that God wants to heal somebody here this morning. I don't, I don't have a word. I don't know who. I'm not going to be like, I got somebody with a broken, uh, I'm not, I don't have that. I think God can do that. I don't have that. I'm just making an invitation to say, you're going to get out of your seat. And whatever it is that you have, we're going to have a prayer. As a matter of fact, prayer team, come now. Worship team, come now. And this is how we're going to end that we believe God wants to do something. And I don't know how or why, I just know God still does this. And so as we close with this closing song, this is it. If you're here and you need to be healed of something, there's something you have. You need to have faith. And you need to get up out of your chair. And you need to have one of these people pray for you. And it doesn't matter, there's nothing magical about this, right? Guys, listen to me. Listen to me. There's nothing magical about the words that you're going to say, that you have to say the right thing. You're going to tell them what's going on, and they're going to pray to our Almighty Father and say, would you do something here? And we're going to pray. We're going to pray in faith, and we're going to trust God with the results. So that's how I think we're supposed to close. And I'm excited to hear what God's going to do. I think, I think God's going to do something. I believe that. And so stand. And if you're here and you have something, at some point in the next four minutes, come and be prayed for.